Arts Manager here at the Evergreen Cultural Center. I'd like to welcome you all to the gallery. Um, it's always a pleasure uh, to introduce an exhibiting artist. We're thrilled to have a talk with Janine Co. this evening. This exhibition that you're sitting within is on view until November 4th. So still lots of time to come back for repeat visits and look at everything in depth. So just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Um, some of you may have visited Lulu Living, which is in our parking lot right now on your way in. If you haven't had the chance, we'll be open this evening after the talk. So you can head out there to see your tiny home. Uh, just please be aware that we are recording this evening, courtesy of ARIA TV, so that is taking place. So I'd like to formally start our evening off by acknowledging that the Evergreen Cultural Center, the Art Gallery, and all the work that we do here takes place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coquitlam First Nation. And that this lies within the shared territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, and Stolo peoples. The statement of recognition and respect is always a significant context for our exhibitions, and the connections are especially evident in this exhibition, which, through functional structures, archival photographs, and architectural panels, draw our attention to questions of land use, ownership, and how we live as individuals and as a community. So tonight we have the great pleasure of hearing from Vancouver-based artist Jermaine Co. on her creative enterprise, Homemade Home. Over the course of a 25-year art practice, Co has distinguished herself in the pursuit of the ordinary. Her search for significance in everyday actions of familiar objects has produced eclectic works that range in mediums and methods, and this project involves building structures such as those that surround us, as well as the aforementioned Lulu Living, a 170 square foot uh, tiny house on wheels. Currently, Jermaine is serving as the city of Vancouver's first engineering artist in residency, um, and her work has been exhibited nationally and internationally. She was the recipient of the 2010 Viva Award, which is presented to outstanding mid-career artists in British Columbia, and she was shortlisted in 2014 for the National Soviet Art Award. And with those accolades in mind, please join me in welcoming Jermaine Coe. Okay. Well, thank you for the re for the um, very formal introduction, and I will counter that by saying that I'm hoping that we can be quite informal. So, if any questions arise in the, as I'm talking, please just pipe up so that we don't all so that it's not me versus you guys. Okay. And I was also very cognizant that we um, that we were going to have teenagers in the in the house, so I was like, oh, we, uh, yeah, we have <laughs> we have to be aware of like short attention spans. <laughs> that in mind. Um, so with all that, uh, all that said, it's really so, so, so nice to be here, it's so nice to have uh, familiar faces that I'm connected to in, uh, in various uh, different ways and um, uh, you know maybe that'll play in a little bit to how into how I talk about the work that I do or what I'm trying to do with my work. Um, so I was invited to do this exhibition around my, my project Home at Home, which has to do with buildings, specifically building, exploring small structures, small, small dwellings, um, uh, which is um, kind of, you know, if you, a, a little bit of a funny thing for me to have decided to do, given that I was never trained to, uh, until recently, to build it anything. What I was trained to do was to be a painter. I went to art school for, for that. So, um, so building is still um, just one of the things that I do. But I, and I wanted to just mention um, some of the other things that I've done or give you an idea of the range of things that I do and so that you can maybe get an idea of how this fits in and makes sense. Um, what do you want? Over here? <laughs> <laughs> Closer to the wall. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I know. I have a family. They're all the have actors in my family, and they would all be they would all do this seamlessly, I'm sure. <laughs> but, um, um, so, like, so my interest. So I was trained as a painter, but I do things ranging from you know, performance work to some installations and um, some community-based things. So, for example, I'll give just an idea of a couple of other things that I've done recently. So uh, one of my other ongoing projects is, um, is called LEAD. And the basis of LEAD is to get 
invite people to get together to play invented games and sports. And the idea behind that is that play is, and I've got some people here who participated in league events before, the idea behind that is to, um, is that play is this really amazing um, means of getting us out of our individual shells and, and uh, encouraging us without our even half being aware of it to interact with each other and to solve problems together. So it's an exercise in sort of creative, collective, problem solving. Um, and and what, this is the, there's this amazing thing that happens during these collective events where you, all of a sudden you'll get, well you'll start off with a group like this of mixed uh, ages, mixed professions, artists, sports people, uh, professionals, and then the next thing you know you've got like, you know, lawyers tackling 12 year olds on, on, the, on the field and stuff like that. And, uh, all in the, in the process of, of like solving a problem that we set out together, which is like, okay, let's, we're going to make a game that has, uh, that uses um, bubble gum or something like that, right? So, um, so it's, uh, it, so the work that I'm doing is all about trying to look at how we connect with each other and the systems that connect us to each other. So for another example of a, of a piece that I've, uh, I've done is um, um, I took a turnstile, you know, you, like you see at the entrance to, um, to uh, the sky train or whatever, um, except one of those turning ones, not the, not the doors. Um, and I modified it so that it's turning automatically in relation to the speed of the wind outside. So it's like it's connecting us to these systems around us that shape our daily lives and that don't, that we don't, that we maybe don't pay attention to uh, very often. So it's turning in relation to the speed of the wind. So on windy days you have to kind of have to move fast on it, around it. On calm days you can be on meander. And so it's somehow make, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, making this relationship between how we, or pointing out a relationship between how we behave and the weather. So it's, it's it, and showing up uh, this correlation that we might not normally think of, because that's exactly how we behave. On calm days, we kind of, you know, saunter along. On windy days, we get where we're going really, really fast. And so, it's, so all of the work that I do is trying to point out um, systems and connections, um, and, and to point out the kinds of the things that we have in common rather than the things that that uh, separate us. Um, and so, with that, you know, that being the how I would characterize the, the very basis of my art practice, um, it seemed really quite, at some point, quite necessary to address the question of how we live together in our communities, just because this is a, it's a, it's a topic that is so pressing for us um, these days. And, um, you know, so I took it upon myself to to start to think about, you know, what are the what are the typical forms of of housing that we have, and and to think about whether we could imagine some other ones, um, you know. And of course, I'm uh, there's quite a bit of information out there these days that suggests that you know if we could if we could lower our our ecological footprint that you know, that would be a good start for making more sustainable communities and so on. So, uh, and, uh, you know, living small is one of the ways in which, in which that can, can happen quite readily. So, um, so I decided, what the heck, I'm going to, let's see if I can, let's see if I can come up with some, some kind of, um, some interesting solutions to how, uh, not, you know, or some interesting, if I could, if I could contribute to the, Conversation. I don't want to be so bold as to say that I have solutions, but maybe, maybe like I have, you know, given that I have the privilege of being invited to, to do exhibitions in white cubes and so on, maybe I've got kind of a platform to, to put out ideas in, into to the world, whether they, they are, you know, whether or not they're very practical. Okay, so, so I have an idea and I have an intention. The only thing I don't have is the knowledge <laughs> necessarily about how to do it. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, in um, part of having an, having an interest in systems and how things connect is, is, is that a part of that is to, uh, 
is to have is that I have a real interest in how things work and how things come together and how uh, uh, you know how how things happen. So the process of stuff is just as important to me as the end end product. So um, you know, and, and and to me, there's nothing more um, nothing more nothing makes me happier than to be learning new skills. And so. Um, I decided that there was no reason I couldn't take it upon myself to build a small structure uh, like this that falls under the, you know, under the limit at which you need an actual proper building permit. Um, so, uh, so I did know that there's this threshold in many places. It's 100 square feet. So I thought, you know, I can, I can go. Well, I'm being a little disingenuous. I've built things before, but, but you know, I had never built a full-on, you know, a, a, a house from scratch. Um, uh, and, um, you know, so that's, that's, you know, this more or less starting with the idea, can a person, or a question, can a person not particularly trained in construction and without, you know, a huge body of knowledge uh, of, of all the regulations, can a person like that with a reasonable, you know, reasonable ability to, to learn, build their own house? Um, and, and so, you know, something like this is a, is is kind of the is the provisional answer to that to that question. Um, and so when I started talking to other people about about uh, building and about this 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 inkling that I had that we could all, you know a lot of us could take could take control of of um, could in fact you know have more control over the ways in which we live than than we even necessarily think of think we. We, so, so many of us live in ways in which we have no connection at all to the houses that we that we that we live in. We have no idea how the boiler works, even, or how the you know what goes on behind the walls, what how the what is holding the entire thing up, and um, and uh, you know what? And and uh, it's a it's a pity because we you know we we really um, uh, it's. I'll tell you, having done this building project, that one, one of the, uh, it's incredibly satisfying to, to, to start a day with a building in one state and to end the day, and it's, it's, a, it's significantly advanced. Uh, and there's just nothing like, you know, closing the door behind, behind a space that you've built and, and closed in, and, and uh, this is incre it's incredibly satisfying. Um, so I feel like, you know that this project is trying to to be kind of an example of, uh, of showing that that is that's actually somehow possible. So when I first started tell, talk, talking up uh, to to friends and uh, that that I was going to start uh, building that I was going to tackle building a small um, a small and start by build, start start by building a small house, everyone said, "Oh, I want to I want to help build." Um, swing a hammer. And so so this, for example, um, this hundred square foot little um, little uh, dwelling, well we're calling it a studio, <laughs> um, was built almost all by volunteer labor um, and, and uh, all, you know, mostly untrained, uh, untrained uh, builders. Uh, so there's people that come in with, with no experience, having even you know used a, used a circular saw, and going away with some degree of comfort and uh, and the satisfaction of having known that you put up a wall, right? Yeah. <laughs> so and insulated, uh, you know. And um, Zemmy is part of that. Is uh, one of the people who helped build. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's 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 really. Um, I mean, I guess this project wants to sit as an example of uh, this, this sort of larger uh, homemade home project. Wants to sit as an example of, uh, you know, the fact that doing it yourself is not so very far out of the realm of, of possibility. Um, but then the other side of that question is that, you know, you, we're not really allowed to live in hundred square foot um, buildings. Um, there we have. We have, for example, minimum building sizes that that uh, that are regulated by by cities. There's building 
they're building codes uh, and so on that that uh, that mean that you know it's that, that make it hard for for amateurs to uh, to contemplate that idea of making of building their own uh, their own homes. So uh, another part of the or sort of flip side to the to the um, to the project um, besides the actual building is to do a certain amount of advocacy for um, for the right of small homes to ex ex exist um, uh, because that process would be way more uh, uh, feasible if, if, for example, people were allowed to build very small dwellings, if people were allowed to build things on the scale of a tiny house on, on, on wheels, right? I mean, that's a, that's a much more feasible and affordable option. Um, but these things aren't actually um, allowed in very many municipalities. We're starting to see in, um, in some communities, especially ones that are facing really, sh really big shortage of housing, like places like Tofino, which have done away with minimum building sizes. They're just letting people build the size of the dwelling that they want, that they want to build. Um, so, it's, so it's really a matter of political will. So a part of the work that needs to be done is a kind of advocacy for, um, for a variety of housing types. And we're also hearing from it. I mean, we heard so much in the in the uh, recent election about you know about questions of housing, the fact that there isn't there isn't enough of the kind of housing that we need, the, the housing that's a, that's made for uh, people who can't afford to buy a half million dollar condo or a million dollar house, or or who don't want to live in a you know five thousand square foot house and, and so on. So um, there's a there's a big gap in the in the housing options for, for uh, on the small end of, uh, of housing. So part of what this exhibition is trying to do is to draw, is to um, lay out some of the options, not only that I'm suggesting, but also that a lot of other developers and activists and, and builders in the region are proposing. So all of these architectural panels that you see here are all by, uh, are showing projects by different organizations, all in the Pacific Northwest, all of whom have some kind of a, are proposing some kind of a solution to um, alternative forms of housing, specifically on the small end of the scale. So you get things like, so there are people building tiny houses on wheels, um, including the one that's part of the show of Lulu Living that's out in the parking lot. You get things like some new form formats for housing, such as um, co-housing. So that's a, that's a form of housing where a, a number of people will get together, own a building collectively, and instead of having their own separate apartments, there's a, there's a fair amount of shared amenities, like there's always common rooms, common, like co-working spaces and so on, so that your actual private space might be a, bit, a bit smaller and there's a, there's a notion of community built into it. So that's one interesting thing. There's some people who are proposing um, communities of various of quite small buildings, like uh, cottage size uh, buildings. Um, there's some developers of Langley houses. Uh, there are the temporary modular housing kinds of projects that um, that we have going on going in um, around the province. Um, interestingly, and really close to my heart, there's there are a number of. Um, Communities uh, that are either built, grown up organically, or have been planned uh, for low-income uh, communities. So there's uh, Dignity Village in Portland, which is like a which started out as a, home, uh, a tent a tent city and has grown into a a community of, of uh, self-built buildings. Um, so that's on one end of that range, and the other end is this architect-designed um, community for uh, of low-income housing in uh, Eugene, Oregon. Um, uh, so what else do we have? We also have like the, um, we have uh, a, a reminder of some of the um, uh, more unusual forms in which housing has, more unusual but still, you know, kind of common in their own way of housing that have, that have grown up in the region. So there's like, um, one of the cabins that was that was part of the uh, community of squatter cabins that were on the on Burrard Inlet that have been cleared out, or you know that were cleared out one by one by one. And these folks uh, that are that are featured over in the in the corner there um, have saved the last one of these squatter cabins and are going to 
turn it into a floating artist residency along with the Tiny House. Um, there's an example of the flow cones that are, that are, um, that are tucked away all along our waterways. Um, there's a beautiful uh, tree house that was secretly built on Crown land. Um, there's uh, my, my, uh, my buddies, the Tiny House Warriors, who are um, and it's interesting that a lot of the uh, um, well, let me tell you. The t so, tiny house warriors are um, are a group from the Sikhlet Nation who are building small um, houses to place on the root of the uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline, as a way, both as a way of asserting their right to the land and a, as a way of uh, building housing for their community. So, it's like this really amazing. Um, uh, initiative uh, to just um, do it yourself to address a real pressing need. Um, so those are some of these really like current uh, current examples of people that are really that are out there trying to um, trying to uh, solve the problems. I guess you're you're probably all wondering whether this is eventually going to turn into something. Right? <laughs> I, I just I need something to put with my hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing, I'll be amazed if it turns into something. The, um, the other part of the exhibition, um, on the other wall behind you, is a whole is a collection of archival images um, that have been drawn from also from the immediate region that remind us of some of the of the remind us that the idea of do it yourself housing, so building your own housing has been with us for a very long time in, in this region, right? The, the, and the idea of kind of provisional housing. Um, like it hasn't always been luxury condos by any, any means for, you know, the, the history of our of housing in the, in the area includes lots and lots of examples of squat, squatting villages, of just vernacular housing, vernacular meaning time ordinarily stuff, ordinary and ordinarily built. Um, housing for, for workers. There's the, the um, uh, seasonal camps for the First, for the first Nations. There's the little uh, cabins on the, that were the you know, first signs of colonization on the mountains. Um, and so it reminds us that this, you know, the, the population in this, in this area has always has been transient for so long and, the, and, and people have been finding ways of Building the housing to address those those conditions for, for just as long as people as settlers have been here, or even even before the settlers were here, you know the First Nations also uh, were moving seasonally. Um, so there's some and there's some wacky ones ones in there as well. So so that's what we have in, in terms of the kind of in, information about um, or that, that's providing background, I guess, for for, for this. And then the things that I've built that appear in, inside the gallery here are, are, are kind of like uh, conceptual models, I would call them. For, so, so, you know, given that I am not uh, qualified to be a home builder of the sort that, would, that one could, you know, of the sort that could give you a warranty on a new home, um, I am the kind of builder who, who uh, can put ideas out there into the world. And so that's what, so the, the things that I've built that appear in the gallery are in the order of ideas. Um, so what we have here is what we have here, and I'm surprised that this isn't fully occupied, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we have here is a, a sort of a, a, a part of a set of large cabinets. So these things are, can come apart and, and, and move into different configurations that provide the basic living services. So the idea that you could sort of bring these large cabinets into a space and hook them up to a to the existing plumbing, and then you'd have kind of your basics for 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 living. Um, to uh, uh, um, this uh, this piece that was um, a uh, that's styled after a, a phone booth with all of the associations that we have with phone booths. That we know that they're kind of they're the place you go where transformations happen. So so this thing is available. Um, to appear on different sites, it's got these wheels that you can attach to it to make it mobile, and and this has been been used for um, different kinds of, of public programs. So people people could uh, you know use it as a little display space or a service kiosk or um, a projection booth. Um, 
uh, and also, given the conditions in, that, we're, that we're living in, also what half the people who see it are thinking is, oh, I can live there, right? Or, so it's, it's, it's nonetheless participating in that kind of conversation around, around housing and, what the, and, and who has the right to occupy public space and so on. So it's all part of that kind of conversation. conversation. Um, and then as a kind of proof of concept that one actually doesn't need much of a budget to build, there's a, a little, a little uh, service kiosk behind me that's called Park to Go. And uh, it's built completely, uh, it, it was built on no budget, it was built out of scraps from, left over from other, other uh, uh, building projects. Um, not even large building projects. So um, it, it's, you know, and, and I'm kind of imagining this, it's, again, that's the kind of, uh, of um, structure that uh, we would look at and say, oh, you know, there's a lot of people that are actually living on our streets that would probably appreciate having something even that uh, modest. Um, and, and so it's, you know, it's, it's um, you know, all of these things are in service of trying to, to uh, broaden the conversation about how we can, what, what the shape of our, our communities could be and so on. So I, I'm taking the, the opportunity of being invited to be, to have exhibitions, to have, to put out these kinds of provisional ideas that may not be very practical in terms of actual, they're, they're not necessarily proposing actual living, uh, uh, living uh, situations, but more trying to, you know, propose uh, different ways in which we can uh, relate to each other. And, uh, yeah, they're on the order of, of concepts. Um, but then out there in the, in the parking lot is an, is an actual functional um, little building on wheels, 170 square feet. We call it Lulu Living. We call it Lulu Living because it was first shown in Richmond, which is on Lulu Island. So I was thinking of it as a, and I, I thought it would make, I styled it after a kind of a shipping container. So trying trying to pay homage a, a little bit to the different ways in which, you know, trans, transitoriness, trans, trans, transience has been, uh, um, a part of the history of, uh, of Richmond, when shipping, that comes to all of the all of the little uh, float homes that are uh, around the around that city, um, and, uh, and and so on. So um, so if if you think it looks like a shipping container, that's on purpose. Uh, <laughs> although it does have a nice entrance that, that hopefully feels a little more welcoming and uh, and warm. Um, uh, but that one is that one's intended to operate as a as a full on, you know, proper house. Um, it's styled in a way that uh, makes you, uh, you know, that should feel like a pretty normal kind of living space. So we can talk about that. And we'll go up there af afterwards, and 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 uh, you, you know, can, we're open to feedback about whether that does or doesn't hit the hit the intention. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so it's designed, it's, it's uh, very small, it's probably still larger than your typical uh, student dorm room. Um, and it's, it's got complete services that can either be <coughs> off-grid or else attached to typical city services. So I'm hoping to find a place to, uh, for this to land, for this to, to dock somewhere within Metro Vancouver where it can be hooked up to services and continue to sort of operate as a, as a, um, a study in what you know and how viable this could be. Because so I chose to do chose this particular format of the tiny house on wheels because it seemed like that is the format that is closest to being um, one of the formats that's closest to being um, kind of approved in the in for 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 use. Right? No one's no one's going to create a zoning designation for tree houses, for example. <laughs> you know, but uh, but the, but it's you know it's it's possible, and, and, and they've done it elsewhere for to, to create a zoning that allows that allows for tiny houses. I mean, they have them all over the city of Portland, for example. They they've just allowed accessory dwellings. They call them. And then the the house is open. Yeah. Should we all go? Well, this is.
this may be, this will be definitely more people than we've ever had. Yeah, maybe <laughs> All right, out here. And Michelle is going to go up there, right? And, or yeah, someone's going to go up She's already, she's already, already there. Already there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll hang out here in case people okay. have more questions. Great. So, yes, feel free to go and visit the tiny house out in the parking lot when you're living or stay here, ask me questions, view the exhibition. Thanks so very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.